Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Architects of the West Kingdom. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. For your convenience, I've added timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial. Also, my copy of the game uses upgraded components from Top Shelf Gamer. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Architects of the West Kingdom is set at the end of the Carolingian Empire around 850 AD. This is the first of the West Kingdom trilogy games by Shim Phillips and Sam MacDonald. Players take the role of royal architects of the kingdom, trying to construct landmarks and advance work on the Archbishop's Cathedral. Only architects with a high noble status can work on the cathedral, and those with more questionable morals can gain better resources in the black market. Once a set number of constructions have been built, the game will end. Whoever has achieved the most victory points will be the winner. To set up the game, lay out the main game board in the center of the table. Shuffle the two-sided black market cards so they're facing the same way. One side has two resources shown and the other four. Place the shuffled deck on the left black market space with the two resource side face up. Shuffle the light green reward cards. Depending on your player count, you'll have a different size deck. Include two reward cards per player plus one. Any others won't be used. Place this shuffled deck face down to the right of the cathedral on the game board. Collect all the debt cards and place them in a pile near the guardhouse beside the board. The unpaid side should be face up. Place the resource multiplier cards below it. Since the resources in the game are meant to be unlimited, players may use these multiplier cards to keep track of higher quantities of a given resource. Shuffle the blue apprentice cards and place them in a face-down deck to the right of the board. Reveal an apprentice card face-up on each of the eight spaces in the bottom right area of the game board. Shuffle the green building cards and place the deck face-down to the left of the workshop. Create supply piles near the board for various resources. You'll have clay, wood, stone, gold, marble, and silver coins. Add four silver to the tax stand space. Each player should choose a color player board and take the 20 workers in the matching color. For your first game, play with the standard color side face up. The back of these boards can be used for a more variable game. For the variable game, either randomize the player boards to everyone or let them choose. Each color has a unique ability plus a differing amount of starting resources. The player who starts the game with the highest virtue will go first in the variable game. Everyone places one of their colored player markers underneath the cathedral, as well as one on the seven space of the purple virtue track. Take the shuffled green building cards and deal four to each player. Players will get to draft their starting hand. So each player simultaneously chooses one of the four to keep, placing it face down in front of them. Then, everyone pass the remaining cards to the player on their left. Everyone chooses one more from these to keep and passes the rest left. Continue like this until you've collected three green building cards. Instead of passing the fourth card, place it on the bottom of the building card deck. Players should keep their hand of building cards secret throughout the game. Randomly choose a starting player. Play will go clockwise from them. Give the start player 3 silver, second player 4 silver, third player 5 silver, and so on. With that, you're set up and ready to play. The game goes in a clockwise order with players taking turns placing one of their workers on a location on the main board. Everyone has 20 workers in their color. The workers stay on the locations they're placed. By going to the location again with more of your workers sitting there, your actions are boosted. However, one of the spaces on the board lets players capture workers on the main board. They could even be opponent's workers. The captured workers will sit on the capturing player's personal board. These may be turned into the prison on the board later for silver. The owner of those workers will want to visit the prison to release them back to them to be used again. Of course, if a player starts their turn without any available workers to use, 
they must spend their whole turn gaining one of their workers back from the main board. They may not take this from the guild hall, black market, prison, or any opponent's player boards. Many cards and action locations may reference a monetary cost. The number of coins shown is how much must be paid. However, the red coins indicate the coins are paid to taxes. The taxed coins go to the space above the tax stand. The gray coins pictured are returned to the general supply. During the game, players will go up and down on the virtue track. By ending the game with a high virtue, they'll gain extra victory points, but being low on the virtue track also lets them interact with the black market and avoid a lot of taxes. If your marker is on a low virtue number that shows an X over a taxed coin, you may avoid paying that many taxed coins on any taxed action. By having less than 10 virtue, players are allowed to go to the black market spaces. By having four or less virtue, they may not build on the cathedral anymore. Also, if at the bottom of the virtue track and you lose a virtue, you'll take a debt card. These sit in front of the player face up showing the unpaid side. Gain a debt for each virtue lost. However, if at the top of the virtue track and you gain another virtue, you may destroy an unpaid debt card. Destroyed debts are returned to the debt card pile. Players may gain apprentice cards from the workshop during the game, who each provide ongoing benefits for certain action locations. Each apprentice also has a specialized expertise noted by the icon in its upper left corner. Some building cards require you to have certain apprentices in your tableau before being allowed to build them. The majority of points earned in the game is through building construction cards in front of you or by building up the cathedral. Each time a player builds, they add one of their workers permanently to the build track by laying it down flat. Workers are placed from top left to bottom right, moving to the next row when hitting the column matching the player count. So, once the final worker is added to the board like this, the game end trigger is met. Every player, including the one who placed the last worker, gets to take one final turn before final scoring. Players may still build on their final turn, even though the track is full. Most of the locations where your worker can be placed show a large white circle. Any number of workers can sit here from any number of players. These are also the locations that workers may be captured from. The black market has small circles, meaning only one worker can occupy them at a time. These workers are only removed when the black market reset is triggered, but I'll review all that later. The top right area of the guardhouse is the prison location. Workers may not be directly placed here. They must be brought here by an opponent's guardhouse action or during a black market reset. So what do the various locations do? There are several locations to gain resources. You'll gain the indicated resource for the location, but how much is determined by the total number of your workers there, including the one just placed. The quarry gives you one stone per worker. The forest gives you one wood per worker. The mines location gives you a choice of clay or gold when placing your worker. You may not split and collect some of both in a single turn. Clay is given at a rate of one per worker there, plus one. Gold may be gained at a rate of one gold for every two of your workers. Other players' workers at a location never affect how much you will receive. These are the basic resources you'll need in the game to build most construction cards. You can gain money at the silversmith location. Going here gives the player one silver coin, plus one coin for each of their workers present. You may instead choose to go to the tax stand location. As players pay taxes, the coins are collected in this area. When you place a worker here, you can gain all the coins. The penalty for such an action, though, is you must immediately lose two virtue. Note that you can't go here if there's no coins available. The black market consists of three single worker spaces. If a worker occupies the space, you may not go there. To place a worker in the black market, the player must have nine or less virtue. Each of these three spaces is tied to the action shown below it. The cost of going here is shown above. So the first space costs one silver coin and loses the player one virtue. Then they gain the shown resources on the card below it. The third space costs three coins and one virtue. They may gain the resources on the card below it. The middle space costs two coins and a virtue. They may either gain any face-up apprentice card or draw five building cards and keep one. The rest are discarded under the deck. If the apprentice hired had silver coins on it, they may take them. During the game, the king may order checks to make sure workers are held accountable for their actions. 
This is known as a black market reset. There are two ways it's triggered. The first is once all three spaces are occupied by workers, and the second is when someone builds at the guild hall and places their worker on a space that shows the black market reset icon. When the black market reset is triggered, let the current player finish their turn before resolving the reset. To resolve it, first move all the workers in the black market to the prison, then flip the left card over and place it on the right space. If there are no more cards in the left pile, shuffle all the cards from the large market pile and form a new small market pile. Next, any players that have apprentices in front of them that have black market reset abilities will activate. Each player may choose the order their apprentices trigger if more than one can. Now each player who has three or more workers in prison loses one virtue. Lastly, the player or players with the most workers in prison takes one debt card. They'll place it with the unpaid side face up in front of them. The King's Storehouse location gives you a choice of two possible actions, one of which to move up the Virtue Track, and the other to gain the Marble Resource. You can take one action per worker you have there. They can be any combination of the two actions available. You can also do the same action multiple times, depending on your workers there. The first one shows that you can pay two basic resources to gain a virtue. It can be any combination of stone, wood, and clay. When gaining a virtue, move your player color marker upwards once on the virtue track. The second action shown here lets you pay three of the shown resources to gain one marble token. It can be three of any combination of stone and wood. Marble is used for high-end buildings and the upper levels of the cathedral. Additionally, marble and gold are worth one victory point at the end of the game. The workshop is another board location that gives you options. However, you can only do one action, so you must choose which one you're doing each time you place a worker there. The top action lets you gain an apprentice. The bottom action lets you draw building plans. To hire an apprentice, you should pay four silver. Two of these are taxes, so those are placed in the tax stand. The number of workers you have here determines which column you can choose up to. So if you place your third worker here, you can take any of the six apprentice cards from the first three columns. If you have the money and are desperate to gain an apprentice from a higher level, you still can. You can place a silver coin on the leftmost apprentice card to let you skip a column. To skip multiple columns ahead, add another silver coin to the next apprentice card going right. For example, let's say you place your second worker and want to take the apprentice in the top right, which requires four workers. Since you have two, you'll have to spend two coins to get to the fourth column. The first coin goes on the first apprentice card in the top row, and the second coin placed on the second apprentice following. Remember that these coins are extra costs to the normal four coin cost already paid. After hiring an apprentice, place it face up in front of you. Fill the empty space by sliding cards from the right to the left, then draw a new card from the blue deck to sit in the rightmost space. Players may have multiple copies of the same apprentice, however, you may not hold more than five at a time. You may discard them from your area at any time, which can allow you to still hire someone. Sometimes the apprentices have a lightning bolt icon on the right of their card. The shown effect happens immediately when hired. The effect could be to gain a virtue or to lose a virtue. Players who hire an apprentice with coins on them get to collect that money as a bonus. The appendix rulebook has a detailed description of each apprentice card on pages 2 and 3. The other action possible at the workshop is to gain building plan cards. You can draw one off the top of the deck, then for every two of your workers you can draw an extra card. Players have a six card hand limit of building cards. You may draw more than the hand limit, but discard down at the end of your turn. When discarding building cards, place the discards at the bottom of the deck. The town center is the location that allows a player to round up and collect workers from a single board location. Only workers at large open circle locations can be collected. For each of your workers here, you may pay one coin to capture one group of workers from one location. The first collection silver coin paid is taxed. The extra collections are paid to the general supply. One group of workers means a single color. When paying to do multiple captures, you must capture the additional groups from the same location spot. You don't have to do more than one capture if you don't want to or can't afford to. And you may capture your own workers, letting you reuse them for later turns. You may also capture workers from the town center, including the one you just placed. If playing a solo game or with two or three players, you may capture workers from up to two locations instead of being limited to one. 
Collected opponent's workers should sit in the top left section of your player board. They may be turned in for money at the guardhouse. The guardhouse is the large location in the upper right of the game board. There are four possible actions to be taken there. You may take one action per worker that you have there. The first option is to turn in collected opponent's workers to prison. Place them in the prison area and take one silver coin per worker. The money comes from the general supply. The second option lets you release your own color workers from prison and collect them back to your player board and there's no cost for this. The third option lets you release and collect your workers that are still on other players' boards. You can either pay five silver, two of which are taxed, or choose to lose a virtue and gain a debt card. The last option lets you pay a collected debt. If you pay six silver, three of which are taxed, you can flip over one of your unpaid debt cards. Unpaid debts are negative two victory points at the end of the game. When paying a debt, you immediately gain one virtue. These four actions can be done in any combination and number of times, limited by the number of workers a player has there when taking the action. The guild hall is the upper left area of the board and corresponds to constructing building cards and the cathedral next to it. To do one of these, place a worker flat on the board in the next empty space. The spaces are filled from top to bottom, left to right. When playing with less than five players, not all the columns are used. The numbers in the right spaces mean you only place a worker there if playing a game with that same number player count. The guild hall is also the game timer, as once it's full, the game end is triggered. To construct a building card, choose a card from your hand to build. Check if it has any apprentice skill requirements. There are three possible icons, carpentry, tiling, and masonry. As long as you have an apprentice or apprentices matching the icon required, you may build it. Apprentices are not discarded when checking their skills for a building. Then look at the building plan's resource costs on the left of the card. Pay the shown resources from your collected tokens back to their general supplies. Buildings will sit face up in front of you and will be worth victory points at the end of the game. Their point value is shown in gold in the top right corner. Some buildings have an immediate virtue impact when built, so check for the lightning bolt and the virtue icons. Also, all the buildings at the bottom will show either an immediate effect or an in-game effect. The lightning bolt icon within the brown area means you do or gain whatever's shown when you build it. The flag icon means it's a scoring method for you at the end of the game. At the guild hall, you could also build on the cathedral. Still place a worker in the guild hall, but you'll be paying resources to advance your player marker up the cathedral track. In order to build at the cathedral though, your virtue must be five or higher. To advance, pay the resources shown to the left of the row you're trying to move to. Each level also requires you to discard a green building card from your hand to the bottom of the building deck. Each row shows a limited number of player markers that can occupy that level. If the level you're trying to move to is full, you cannot build on the cathedral or advance. So only one person can get to the top of this track. At the end of the game, players earn victory points shown to the left of their occupied row on this track. Once you pay and move up the track, draw the top card from the reward card pile and gain its benefits. After resolving it, return it to the game box. Once the cards are emptied, all advancements on the cathedral track simply gain players one virtue. The end of the game is triggered once someone places their worker on the guild hall's last possible empty space. That player finishes their turn, and then every player gets one final turn. In this final round, players may still build and place workers in the guild hall. Just place the workers to the side of it. Next, final points will be scored for all players. While a score pad is not included in the box, there's a printable score sheet on the game's Board Game Geek page. Each player will need to tally their total points earned. First, gain victory points for all of your green constructed buildings. Their point value is shown in the top right. Also, gain in-game bonus points from building cards that provide them. Next, add victory points from your player marker's position on the cathedral. Gain the point shown on the left of your row. Then, gain or lose victory points based on the position of your marker on the virtue track. Any unpaid debts will lose the player two victory points each. Next, all unused gold and marble tokens collected by players provide them one victory point each. Players should count any silver coins they still have. For every ten silver, they'll gain one victory point. Now look at the workers still in prison. For every two workers, 
workers a player has in prison, they lose one victory point. One worker has no effect, so round down. The player with the most points wins the game. If there's a tie, the player with the highest virtue breaks the tie. If tied still for virtue, the player with the most silver is the winner. If still tied, they share the victory. Don't forget to check the game's appendix booklet, which describes each color player board's variable abilities and starting resources. That's my first recommendation for your second game. Additionally, you'll find clarifications and full descriptions of each apprentice and building card's abilities and effects in the appendix. Architects of the West Kingdom has an AI opponent to be used in a solo game or even as a third player in a two-player game. To set up the AI player, you'll first need to choose your difficulty. Use the player board for Constantine for a standard game and Helena's board for the harder game. Follow the standard game setup for a two-player game including only using five reward cards at the cathedral. However, remove the four resource market building cards from the deck. They won't be used. Choose your own color and use the standard side. You'll start the game with three silver coins and seven virtue. Choose a color for your opponent and give them all their workers. Also, add their player marker under the cathedral track with yours and their marker at seven virtue. The AI gains no silver or starting cards. Collect all the scheme cards and separate the 20 starting cards cards from the future scheme cards. The starting ones have a brown header, and the future cards have a black header. Shuffle each pile separately. Set aside the shuffled future scheme cards for now. Only draw from this deck when instructed to by one of the cards. Place the starting scheme card deck face down next to the AI's board. The human player takes the first turn. You play as normal, but the AI takes turns according to the drawn scheme card. On their turn, reveal the topmost scheme card from their draw pile. The top of the card indicates where they place a worker this turn. Underneath shows the actions they'll take there. The AI opponent never collects or uses silver, clay, wood, stone, gold, apprentices, or buildings. They don't have to spend resources or building cards to construct the cathedral. The AI can always advance work on the cathedral or visit the black market regardless of their virtue. The only resource they need to gain is marble which will be counted for their in-game points. The opponent can capture your workers, but never their own. When selling your workers to prison, they gain one marble instead of silver. They may also receive and destroy debt cards. If the scheme deck runs out, shuffle the discards into a new draw pile. Should the opponent start their turn without workers, don't draw a scheme card this turn. Instead, return all their workers from large circle spaces back to their board and shuffle their discards back into the draw pile. At the end of the game, calculate your earned points like normal. For the AI opponent, they gain points from the Cathedral, Virtue Track, and one point per marble collected. Subtract two points for any of their unpaid debt cards and subtract one point per pair of their workers in prison. Then, they gain victory points for workers placed in the guild hall. When playing the standard game with Constantine, he'll gain one point per worker. In the harder difficulty using Helena, she gains three points per worker in the guild hall. If you scored higher than the AI opponent, you've won. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. Check the video description for links to Top Shelf Gamer for token upgrades, SleepKings.com for a 10% off coupon on card sleeves, and Mr. Meeple t-shirts for cool board gaming shirts. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around and watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.